infrastructure for if you give me an element and you give me uh, something you want to change about the element, a lot of the back end work could all be encapsulated so that if something changes in your logic, it'll change everywhere. And you can sort of uh, basically enjoy the benefit of having a very oh, just kind of hierarchical system where everything like flows up from these little modules that you build up a very modular approach. Okay. But how that all works in our world is as follows. Let's go ahead and kind of just take a look at where this all is. Let me zoom on out of it. Going the wrong way. I had that selected. Zoom on up. Okay. At a high level, here's our map right now. And what we're doing is we're updating the Revit model a little bit. We're selecting the roof surface. We have the weather. We've got some shading surfaces we want to put in here. We got some Revit settings to set up the time. Most of our work happens right here in this big sort of pink node. Okay. And then from the pink node, the value that we're really interested in is this value over here, this density value that we put together. So what you gotta think about is really just what are the inputs, what are the outputs, and how do you go through and you know kind of isolate those things. So to get yourself going, I might do this. I would say if I want the inputs to be, for example, the element and the value I'm going to put in, if I want to be able to sort of select the shading surfaces outside of the node, I'll pull that over here. If I want to go through and select the time independently, I'll pull that over there. And the only reason I'm pulling them around is I'm about to do a big drag selection of everything I want in the node. So, over here, I'm going to pull that so that basically everything in the middle of the screen is going to become this node. This one over here about selecting the surfaces to analyze, I can actually get rid of that one. I don't really need that anymore. Oh, the weather from the Revit location. Let's go ahead and pull that out. That sounds like you did input surface, input two. Let's come back over here. On the tail end of this, the thing that I'm really interested in is doing is getting this sort of insulation density sort of function over here. So I'll pull the watch out there. So at this point, I can basically take everything in the center of the screen and make it a custom node. Okay. And how you do that is actually pretty straightforward. What you're going to do is basically just drag a box around all of this stuff and anything that's hanging out on the front end will become an input. Anything hanging out on the back end will be an output. So, again, I just reorganized it a little bit like that, just so it would be a little bit easier to do my drag. So again, I'm just pulling the weather over here. I'm pulling, oh, what is this? That's the shading surfaces. This is the time setup, so I can change those things. These are sort of some of my input parameters. I have the element that I want and the value of the roof slope. Again, over here. That's the watch on the uh, density. So if I now just do that and highlight all those things, then I say create a custom node from selection. It'll create a custom node. Actually, let me warn you about this. Sometimes, if there's ever a point that this uh, dynamo is going to break on you, this is a pretty good time where it may happen. So what I'm going to do is actually save my work, just because 
I'm kind of a cautious character. I'll say that's the improved 4B. Yes, to make certain. I'd like to come back again and not lose all this hard work, just in case it does crash on me. I'm going to grab all those, and I'm going to say under Edit, Create a Custom Node, or Node from the Selection. Now, when this pops up, it gives you a dialog that looks something like this. What we're going to do is give our uh, uh, node a name, and we're going to give it a category. We could also give it a description. That description will be useful if we publish this so people can sort of see what's happening here. <laughs> but I'm basically going to take a sort of building element. Yeah, I'm going to say that better. I'm going to say just roof surface. Uh, and what I'm going to do is, oh, what I'm going to do is basically compute the insulation density. I'll say the cumulative insulation Okay, great. I'm going to give it a category. The category you give it is really is where it shows up in the tree. So if you go have your custom nodes, it's where it's going to show up over here in your libraries. I usually call them just part of CE 120. But you can go ahead and start categorizing things by the way you would like them to show up. Say OK. Cross your fingers and notice what has happened. Everything's been replaced by this single node. Now, this single node that has been created, I'm going to zoom in on there a little bit, is kind of currently sitting in the default location on your machine. So it's in your library. That could be sort of an OK place. But if you want to actually <laughs> change it and put it somewhere else, let's pause there. You doing OK in terms of creating it? I see, I see a panic look. People doing good and you got to do it? I didn't do it from selection, so I was like, why is it not creating the Oh, no. And then I did create my own from selection. Okay. <laughs> Once you have that node, you can, if you like, go through and say, edit it. Edit the custom node by right clicking on it. It'll open up the underlying code, and it'll, you'll see it looks amazingly like uh, what we've been doing so far. So. What I typically do more than anything is I'll go through and do a save as just because I want to put it in a better location. So what I'll do is I'll put it in the 12.1. Uh, I'll save it there just so that later on if I have this folder and I open this example, it'll find that node even if I move to a different machine. You can sort of see over here, here are the inputs, and you can change some of these. For example, value is not very informative, so we could go through and say that this is going to be the roof slope value. <laughs> okay, in terms of the transaction start, that's going to be the building model element. All right, really. Weather, I'll probably understand that. Shading surfaces, I think I'll get that. Time study, I'll probably understand that. It's going to go through and do all these things. At the tail end of all this, here's the output. So you might as well give that a name that looks familiar too. So what is this going to be? This is going to be my, uh, what is it? It's my cumulative. Insulation density. Great. So go ahead and save that away. And what you'll find is way back over here, it looks pretty good. Now, with this function, it's going to be a whole lot easier to test things. I'm just going to shove some things down to make it a little bit closer. I'll pull that over just so we can see. Okay, 
Now, this should give you the same results because just the, it's abstracted to a node, but the underlying calculations are all the same. And you can try this a little bit if you want. Go ahead and try changing the roof slope over here, the same run, and see if you get a different value over there. You should be able to go anywhere from five. I'll run that. Looks like it's still working. So for five, the value seems to be around 320,000. If you want to try that at 45, you're going to get a value of about 310,000. If I go over and say, for example, 60, it's about 270,000. So let's kind of think about what's going on here just intuitively in terms of whether we can sort of figure out where we think it'll be best. Because again, it's always good to sort of uh, just try and use your intuition to sort of figure this out. So I basically got my roof slope over here. Here's my building. And I got some sort of sloping roof surface over here. And I got some sun up in the sky. I'll put it right about here. Projecting down on it here. So let's think about what's happening. If I'm very flat, I'm collecting a certain amount of insulation. If I'm at 45, I'm collecting a certain amount. If I'm collecting at 60, I'm collecting a certain amount. Like a Actually, my sun looks like it's a little bit low in the sky for what I want to demonstrate. Yeah, what does your intuition say about really what the value is that's probably going to be the best? Okay, so, and why is that? What's, what's the basic geometry that's going on when it's at the latitude? Uh, it's just, it optimizes throughout the year. But it depends on what, what is our time frame that we're in here. Are we winter or oh, that's a, good, a very good question. Let's go ahead and check that out. That's going to make a difference. If you want to optimize for winter, it's latitude plus 15. OK. So it does it for the whole year when it does the time thing? The it depends on what your sun settings are, right? Yep. Oh. So, so the way this is all set up, we're using the sun settings. So if I come over here, and let's go to our sun settings. Looks like right now I'm just set up for the summertime. OK. So if I did a whole year, Okay, that'd be give you a different answer there. If it's the whole year, what's it then? Then it's the latitude? It's about the latitude. It's between 15, plus 15, or minus 15. Plus okay, great. Plus 15 will be better for the summer, minus 15 will be better for the winter. Okay, let's try that. Again, we can go through and run it. But go ahead and have in your own mind some sort of sense of what you think good values are going to be. Because as we go through and test this, you're ultimately, you're going to get a bunch of numbers back. The question is, do the numbers make sense or not? It would be like 365 times 1,000 would be perfect, right? Oh, I forget the units. Yeah. Well, because it was the BTU we were saying from last time. We're not sure exactly what the units sure. are. Nobody's figured it out. We need to do that by putting a little surface that's like one meter by one meter. Yep. And just try that so we could actually like, uh, come up with a very kind of good number there. Okay, but do you have a function now where if you go through and change these values, you get different values over here? Let's see if you, are. If you don't have that yet, go ahead and open up, oh, whatever it is. It's like 7a or 8a or something like that. Um, I guess 7 would do it. 7b would be where we are right now. Okay, although our node's a little bit different here because we went through and divided through by the area. So if you're opening 7B, it doesn't include that. You can open the node in 7B and kind of add that in there. But in general, we just want to make sure you have something that has a node that's connecting these input values, some sort of output value there. Okay, so is that feeling good? You got that part? More or less? Okay, so here's the 
Oh, second to last step, but this is the critical step in terms of doing it. All of this was really all about just coming up with a really good note for doing our evaluations. And I can share my note with you, you can share your note with me, we can all share these nodes, and you can beg and borrow and adapt them from each other. Okay. If you would like to go through and check a bunch of different values, for example, I'd like to check 50, I'd like to check 45, I'd like to check 40, 35, all those different things, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to say that rather than putting in a single input value for the loop slope, I'm going to try a whole range of different values. Okay, and this is what that would look like. And then we'll use this as a function as opposed to just doing it as a single evaluation. Here's how it would look. If I want to create a range of input values, I could say 5 to 85 incrementing by 5. Okay, that's just that little code block for doing a sequence. We were doing that to create grids of points, but it also creates nice little number sequences for you. Let me just check it out here. So it's five through 85 every five. Okay. What I'm doing now is actually, this is what I call an exhaustive search. I'm trying to figure out where that best value is but I'm not really quite sure where it's going to be. So I'm going to go just everywhere from 0 to 90 or 5 to 85. I'm going to exhaustively search that space, which inherently is maybe not the most efficient way of doing it, because they might look at a lot of points that really aren't all that productive. Okay? But it has a pretty good chance of finding the optimum, because you're sort of spanning the entire area. Okay. So, this is what most people will do as a starting point. We'll use what's called a list map to basically take that list, put all those list values into this function, and kind of get the values. So, exhaustive search. It's effective, and if you have a lot of computing power, it works okay. Now, for our single node over here, we can go from 5 to 85. That's okay. You know, I don't know. What do we have in there? 15 values, 20, not quite, 18 values. Yeah, we have a number of values here. For a single value, it's not so bad. If we were testing several different things, though, this could get interesting because if I was going to change two different variables, it might not be just 16 values. It could be 16 values by 16 values, or 16 values by 20 values. So all of a sudden now I've got like 300 values, or I have 500 values. It's starting to take a long time to grind through every iteration. So this is going to work OK for a single variable, but when we have multiple inputs, it's not necessarily the best strategy. So here's what you do. You go through and create something that looks like this. You've got a list of input values. You create something called a list map. And here's what a list map looks like. Okay. List map takes a list of input values. It takes a function, okay, and then maps them together and gives you a list of output values. So this is basically plugging things in one at a time. Now, the list of values, that's pretty easy. That's my list of input values right there. Okay. For the function, here's how it works. This is such a good looking node over here, it could actually become a function. Because it, as opposed to going ahead and plugging all the values, if we leave one value open, okay, then it becomes a function where you can plug in values that vary and get varying results. So here's what I mean. If I take the roof slope value and leave it open, and then bring that up as a function, what it's going to do is map them one at a time. It will say, let's plug in five get the answer. Let's plug in 10, get the answer. Let's plug in 15, get the answer. So list mapping is actually pretty good. Whenever you see f of x, or you see single function object at some point, what it's usually telling you is that you have some node where some value is open, because then it considers it to be a function. And it's waiting to have some sort of a function applied to it, or a function driver applied to it, to get those values. Okay. So see if you can get that part set up. And if you have that set up, give it a run. And let's see what it is. What it's going to do is take your variables. Actually, I should do this. Let's just be, yeah. In the, in the spirit of uh, walking before we run, before I go ahead and run this over like 100 values or something like that, let me just run it over three values. 
and kind of uh, just see. Because if it's a problem in your logic and it's going to fail, you'd rather have it fail on three than have it fail on 100. So let's just test it. Okay, looks like it's working. Actually, what I should do is shove that window out of the way. If I shove that window out of the way, you'll actually see that the little roof is bouncing around back there in the background. It's at 15 now. Let me shove that out of the way over here, just so you can sort of see that in a minute. Okay, runs completed. Let's take a look at the result of our list map. Our list map is returning three different values there. So the first one is for five, the second one is for uh, 10, the third one is for 15. So you sort of see it's growing a little bit, and that sort of makes sense. We sort of expect it to be growing a little bit as the roof gets further and further up, closer and closer to the latitude. Okay, that's looking good. We can now go through and if we want to, go through and exchange, extend that and actually have it go a little bit further. Let me go up to say 55 as a starting point. So again, I will run that. This time showing you that what should happen is you see in the background, the roof should bounce a little. Okay, it's just one up, one increment. It's bouncing up a little higher. That's where we lost our color. Oh, that's because the color is happening sort of over there inside of Dynamo. It's not happening over here. No, I know, but it's not showing up in there either. Oh, we took it off. Oh, we took yeah, it off. Yeah, we took it off. Faster. Okay, yeah. You gotta figure out how to get that back in, because the color is actually really cool. You know, it's also a really helpful way. What's that? To, to, to get a sense of these really big values. It's what? Just taking the minimum and normalizing it to the minimum so you can see that which value has the highest. That would actually be good too. Yeah. That'd be a very good way to sort of and we can scale it based on that. Yeah. yeah. So right now, like zero is given the, the least, and then it's showing everything from zero to, or one to two point five. Okay. So we got this thing popping around. I like that idea of remapping. Okay. It's still doing its thing over here. Now, this is a pretty simple example. You might imagine, as opposed to this being this sort of simple root form, some big old twisty organic building form that is kind of undulating or growing or shrinking or twisting around more like a flame. It can be all sorts of different things and you can evaluate its performance. I should also comment at this point, right now we're looking at a single metric. We're looking at a single evaluation function. We could actually start looking at several different evaluation functions. So for example, as I make that roof taller and taller, what tends to happen is, okay, it may be getting sort of different amounts of insulation values, but also, it's becoming more and more expensive to put all those solar panels up there. So I have a little bit of a trade-off between the cost of the construction, the cost of the solar panels, and the energy that I'm actually creating. Looks like I'm running it twice. Let me let that finish. Okay, what you'll get out of this should be a whole list of different output values. And that list of output values is in pretty good shape, but we're going to talk about it to make it a little bit more useful to you. Okay, let's go ahead and stop this time. Run started, run started. Okay, run completed. Don't go back. The fact that it flashes there it makes me worry. Okay, let's come on back. Over here, I now have a whole list of different values here. So let's take a look at this as we go zipping on up there. Ooh, check this out. Do, do you spot an optimum in there? I actually spot an uh, optimum value in there. Okay. number six? I believe that the highest value is right over here. Oh, no, the last one there, 10 side. Oh, that's interesting, too. Hmm, that could be interesting about why there might be two. It's kind of interesting that you have Kind of two, which you can, because of what's going on. It's going up, it's going up. It's kind of interesting about why it could be going down. We should think about what's going on there in terms of something going on throughout the year. You can test it, but there's definitely some variation in the values here. 
Okay, here's what we want to do now. Different sort of things. Per Jordan's suggestion, we could go through and try to normalize these out somehow. We could go through and like remap these somehow. I can find the minimum value, divide by the minimum value, and I'm sort of getting a scaled factor. So if I want to do something like that, oh, what could I do? I could basically say, let's go through. And let's flatten it. I'll take those out over there. I think I only have a single layer of hierarchy here. Yep. Then I'll say list minimum item. Let's go ahead and grab that. So I could go through and say here, this is going to be the list item divided by the list minimum. And basically pull the list. See if that works. Let's see what that looks like. It's just going to run the whole list again. So we can definitely go through and do something like this. Let's, I'll just let that run and we'll see that. That's just a way of scaling them. That should be okay. So it would be the list, the bottom one will be one, the overall factor is one over that. Okay, so that should actually work out okay. The other thing I want to show you how to do though that is really very useful is we have all these input value or these output values kind of coming out the back end. We can go ahead and pair them up with the input values. And that's often a very useful thing. If you want, for example, put this out to Excel or something like that, you'd like to have a table where you have a column of the input values and a column of the output values right next to each other. You can sort of see and compare, maybe plot a nice chart in Excel or something like that. Okay. And that's pretty easy to do too. What we're going to do is we actually have, I'm going to just keep on running over here, a list of the input values. They're kind of hanging out over there, just off to the left hand side. We have a list of output values right over here. And what we're going to do is actually just put them together in what's into what I call a data grid, but it's a structure that is understood as being a grid, where we take the first list as one item, and we take the second list as a second item, we put those two lists in a list, okay? That'll give all the input values as the first item, all the output values as the second item. Then what I'll usually do is transpose it, just because as opposed to seeing everything in columns, I like to see things in rows, okay? But very easy operation. Let's see what it looks like. Okay, run completed. Let's see what this looks like. Okay, there I got all those guys kind of hanging around there. Not too bad. From my minimum to, looks like my best value is somewhere around 1.12, 1.11. One. 1.13 at the tail end there. Yeah, so you know what I think is happening? What's that? is that you have these shading devices. So what mm -hmm. happens is you start to see an opti optimum come when you get to around the latitude, or maybe it's yeah. plus a little bit. Okay. And then you start to get another maximum as the top of your roof starts to get full sun and, no, and less, mm -hmm. less and less shade. Okay. So you have so fewer and fewer hours of, of, of shading. Because I'm not just yeah. purely exposed to the sun. Especially at 75, it gets way up there. Yeah, right? so you're getting so you all this unobstructed sun, yeah. and that's why it becomes attractive again. So you have a dual maximum. Very interesting in terms of what's going on. We could go through and change some of the heights of the buildings and kind of test that. We could also, if we know there's a particular range that's of interest, we could go ahead and narrow in on that. We could say, okay, great. Now we know, let's go between 35 and 50 and just get quite narrow and see if we can get quite precise about it. But let's do this like little data grid thing and wrap you up there today. Here's how it'll basically work. I got a list of input values over here. I got a list of output values, and I could use either of these lists. I could use that list right there. That's the raw output values. Oh, da, 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 da. Actually, if I would have done this list, that would have been flatter, as opposed to kind of putting them in there. Okay, let's go through and show you how you make this data grid. 
what you do is you say, let's go ahead and do a list create, because what I want to do is basically get these two different columns together into a list. So the way that works is a little list create action. What the list create lets you do is basically take this column of numbers and that column of numbers and get them together. Now, that's going to be OK in terms of being two columns of numbers. What we're going to actually do at the tail end of this, though, is go through and say, let's transpose that. Because I like to see the data in rows as opposed to that. Okay. And then we'll get something that looks like what I'll call a data grid. Let me go ahead and run that. Now, from here on out, the, if you want to keep on like uh, working with this, we can take the value that comes out of here, this list transpose, the lovely function called Excel write to file, and if you write that as data, it basically writes it out to an Excel file in columns and rows, so you can plot it. What other things we could do? For Noel's suggestion, we could go ahead and say, hey, we found what we consider to be the best item, whatever, whether it was the minimum or the maximum, whatever it is in this list over here. We could go ahead and say, let's grab that and plug it in as the input value to our function so that, you know, basically we change the uh, model so it has the optimum value and then we can colorize that. And that would be a really nice way to kind of display the results. So several different places you can go from here. Okay, finish up, finish up, finish up. So I think that that's all you need in terms of uh, completing the assignment. You got the idea of making the node, you got the idea of doing the list map. Here's what that transpose list looks like, just so you can sort of see it. Well, that's a little messy, that's not quite right. Let me see what's going on with my lists are a little off somehow. What's going on over here? That looks good in terms of that list. What's wrong with this list? Well, we have to flatten the code block, the output value scale, because they are within lists of them. Each of them is in the list. I tried to get rid of that. <coughs> oh, mine doesn't. Let's see what this does. That's not too bad looking there. 0 through 10, 0 through, oh. What do I have a 0 through 10 and a 0 through 9? I'll think about that in just a second. Where, oh, they're just 10 and 10. OK, never mind. So then I would say that this should be, oh, actually, it's doing the right thing. Although the values are a little bit strange. No, I'm looking at these, and they just look funny to me. But actually, these are the correct values, because since we were scaling them to the minimum, 5 has the value of 1, 10 has the value of 1.02, 15 has the value of 1.07. So it is giving us what they want. So if you want to write those out to Excel, and we'll finish here, you say Excel, write to file. So this is what's considered the data. The start row and the start column, Excel is a zero based sort of a spreadsheet, so that's zero and that's zero. File path is just actually some sort of a file path out on your system. What you can do is say that, hey, just a second, uh, name of the str okay. I, guess I, the sheet. I have to name the sheet too? Okay. Uh, I don't know if you have to. That's cool. I think you do. Results. That's sweet. Just to be on the like, safe side. Okay. This, what you do is you go on out here, you go out somewhere to your file system, you say, great, I'm going to create something, sort of results. XLS. Okay, and now it'll write it out there. 
as opposed to uh, kind of just kind of keeping it inside here. Oh, there's another file path right there. Okay, so let us pause there for today. That should be all the essentials there, but the whole idea of list mapping is really very, very powerful. We're going to use it a lot. We've been doing a lot of list mapping with a single very input variable. Next time we're going to talk about how you list map with two variables if you have pairs of numbers you want to consider, so two different inputs. We can also talk about how we can actually start using some different constructs because list mapping is a great one. It's sort of exhaustive. We'll look at one that's called a while loop. A while loop will go ahead and keep on doing something until a condition's met and then stop. Okay, sometimes that's sufficient. And we'll finally start looking at what are called genetic algorithms where we can sort of shoot in the dark a little bit and then based on the results that we're getting back, decide which areas we better explore in more detail. Okay, super. Let us adjourn for today. Interesting. I have a question on one of my lists. It 